under martial law. All residents are required to report to their designated quarantine. Riots have continued for a third consecutive day. And winter... How accurate do you think this particular scenario was? So we've, we've learned in the first 15 minutes of this game that everything has gone very bad, very, very fast. Okay. Um, what, what are your thoughts on how maybe accurate this representation is of, of what would happen in a terrible situation like that? In real life, it would play out maybe over a period of, of weeks or months. And also, given the nature of an infectious disease, you can't have a, a global pandemic that sort of suddenly kicks off in exactly the same, same time at every country in the world. So that even if parts of the US you know, suddenly uh, had this pandemic, it's, you know, the BBC would still be going, Twitter would still be going. The internet is built to be resilient. You can knock out various nodes. The whole po point of it was designed to be you know, resilient against failures. So that element of it seemed to be unrealistic. And that's particularly the way in which we see sort of disasters unfolding now. You, you see it happening on Twitter. People are communicating ab about it. There's all sorts of ways in which people can get access to information outside of formal challenges. I mean, why, why is it then do you think that the game makers love the post-apocalyptic world? Oh, well, there are many reasons. I mean, the the biggest is probably that there aren't so many people around in the post-apocalypse. Uh, it also, there are many things that are important to a video game that aren't necessarily linked to the narrative that work with the post-apocalypse, so you can control resources, for example. It lets you have familiar landmarks, present them in a new way, destroyed, overgrown, whatever. Um, obviously, uh, when we're talking about the opening, there's a lot there that is uh, unrealistic. I, I will bow to the experts. Uh, I think what's, um, what's important about the way The Last of Us is presenting it is it's trying to um, give a very personal, ground-level view of how an unfolding pandemic might work. One thing I think they capture quite powerfully is, is the way that order in society is quite fragile. And it's something that struck me particularly uh, between uh, five years ago, almost to the day when we had the, the, the riots in London. It's a, the fact that it turned out there are only a, f a few thousand police. You know, you've got, got several million people in, in London uh, and in it turned out when it, when it pushed came to shove, they were able to get less than 10,000 police on the streets. And you realise that the number of police to, to number of actual people in, in the society is so small that, that if everybody decides to go on, on, on at the same time and, and create problems or, or order breaks down, then things can go out of, of control you know, within, within minutes, within hours. And it's quite difficult to get that control mm. back again. Um, and I think, well, we see the army are involved there, or the, you know, the National Guard or whatever they are, I think, in this instance. And we don't see any police at all, I guess, there. But we do see a lot of, uh, a lot of medical staff and a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, ambulances flying about. I mean, w were something ever to happen, let's say, t today or tomorrow, I mean, goodness me, uh, how would it play out, do you think? What, what would be the first, the first reaction of the emergency services or the government? What do we think we would do? What, with a pandemic like this? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> let's, let's say a pandemic like this. Why not? Let's go for it. Let's, let's go 10 out of 10 on an awfulness rating straight away. Well, I don't know about This is 11, not so 10. Really? Okay. All right. <laughs> 11 out of 10 then in that case. <laughs> What's the first thing we'd see, you think, from, a, from, a, from an infrastructure perspective? Um, first thing you do is you, you bring together the, the Cabinet COBRA committee. That's the Cabinet Emergency Committee. I'm assuming there must be some kind of protocols for it. We have some things in in place so that part of a, a project I'm involved in at UCL um, together with Public Health England and various other universities is to create a pandemic early warning system effectively to, to do things so that, so that this never happens so that you have a combination of observing what's happening on Twitter, Facebook, things that are openly available, you're putting together uh, things like uh, receipts from, for, from pharmacies, see, seeing whether there's a, there's a rise in people looking for certain sorts of meds and putting that information with, with doctor's appointments to work out well, well, do we need to start vaccinating more people to, so that you can create a, a dashboard where you can see where, where the disease is, is moving, where you need to put resources. So a lot of the game is about ensuring that it doesn't get out of control. But assuming it does get out of control, then you have the a cabinet level committee, COBRA, which is then going to bring the army. I'm, I'm very much assuming, though, I've, tr I've asked one or two very, very senior people and, 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 the, and the question has just been ignored as if I hadn't said it, you know, but that you, you discover all, all, all the ways in which we're being you know, surveilled as, as part of the stuff that was revealed by Snowden. And, and my assumption is, or at least my hope is, that, that things are in place to be able to use that information or in order to help in the fight against infectious disease if it really gets there, if there really was a, a pandemic. They've got a massive amount of information about where people are, things spreading, who's saying what on the internet, and what, which you could mine into, into you know, real-time information about how a disease is spreading. 
if it was me at the heart of government, that would be exactly what I'm doing. I don't know whether people are bright enough to have thought about that or whether they're only looking for spies or other kind of, uh, of, of threats to us. Because clearly the threat from a potential pandemic is much larger. You, you're talking about potentially millions of people dying rather than sort of you know, hundreds of people dying in a terrorist attack. So maybe we're thinking then in terms of this has gone from 1 to 11 in 15 minutes, yeah. obviously, presumably there's a little bit before there. But you're thinking we'll know when it's a 2 or a 3 and yeah. be able to then uh, you know, appropriate resources yeah. wh where they need to go. Yes. Um, but what about from a, a medical perspective? What, what would happen in the first instance, do you think? Well, the UK does have a, a pandemic strategy for things like influenza and for um, other sort of infectious diseases. And obviously they have various threat levels. Um, so I think a lot of it is about sort of planning as well, because uh, as well as people being sick, you're also going to have people off work and there's going to be that impact on kind of the workforce and the delivery. So it really there's a lot of work sort of being done to try and ensure like a whole systems approach, really, to try and kind of address that. I mean, obviously, a lot of the kind of public health England and uh, NHS England stuff is around influenza in terms of something as dramatic as this, I'm not entirely sure <laughs> kind of how that would um, how that would look. But you know, there is certainly um, like a strategy in place that obviously we adapted and took lessons learned from the 2009 mm. influenza outbreak. So you know, there is kind of some infrastructure there. But um, again, so what, what, what sort of lessons are we thinking about? Then obviously, you're right. This is entirely a hypothetical situation, but real. Just inverted commas, scare quotes, similar. So you, you mentioned the sort of pandemic influenza. There was a lot of sort of big scare of that, sort of 2009, 2010, I guess. And, and what lessons were learned from that, do you think? Well, there was obviously that uh, with the swine flu, there was um, lots of things to think about in terms of how much kind of medications like Tamiflu were, you know, stocked up and how accessible that was and how, you know, resources going to be impacted. And there's kind of, you know, modelling work being done to identify potentially how many people would get sick in a scenario like that um, and lots of work being done with you know various businesses to kind of ensure workforce maintenance and you know it's the infrastructure that's going to be quite key in terms of you know everything from healthcare providers right through to can you still get shopping and can you still do things on a day-to-day -day basis what would happen in the first instance personally for me i would be locking the doors i would be closing the blinds i would be putting heavy objects in front of the doors and not going out trying to look at the television obviously the television's gone out there what what do we know about the sort of any research that's been done on on what people tend to do and what do you think you would do if something like this happened i mean panic <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that seems, seems like the point one would be freak out I'm yeah not. I, i'm not really the man you want in charge um i think uh you know Let's say rather than turning people into raging zombies, we were dealing with a pandemic that was very, very contagious, mm. uh, something like that. You would want to avoid other people. It seems to me quite unnatural in that situation. You'd want to be in the middle of a crowd where uh, anyone could be. I also think um, James made a great point about uh, one of the themes of this introduction really is how fragile mm. our social structures are, society kind of falling apart. And it makes this point very, very powerfully at the end because Sarah isn't killed by the pandemic. She's killed by the government. Um, panicking not sure what to do they just mm. don't want people out of the perimeter so they open fire on a young girl um and stuff like that is what scares me far more than infectious diseases to be honest really so so it's the uh, maybe i dare i say over uh, heavy-handed response to something we don't know what it is yeah our, our social structures aren't necessarily set up to cope with say a very contagious disease that was also uh, very fatal um mm. Very fatal. <laughs> yeah, well, faithfully <laughs> fatal, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, in that kind of uh, scenario, you might see, you know, feral behaviour, the kind of red and tooth and claw part of man's nature, which mm. in modern society is just not that close to the surface. But it's ready at any point. So y but you're the same as me. You're staying in. You're maybe a single more or less yeah i'm a single I'm, I'm bead of sweat in the I'm head i'm trying to avoid large crowds yeah and we'll see how long i last okay <laughs> and what about yourself what do you think stay in yeah stay in i would definitely be staying in. yeah yeah and me too <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah.